Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your guys' heart to come out. Um, we really do. And uh, it's, it really is a breath of fresh air in the generation we live to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention before we begin is this is our third course. And so at the very beginning, we did seven classes called Bible Basics. And we um, attempted to answer some just basic questions about the Bible. Why was the Bible written? Um, who wrote the Bible? And we went through and asked the question, what sets the Bible apart from all other books? We asked the question, well, what do you believe and what have you received? And then we attempted to answer the question, um, how did we get the Bible? What is the purpose of studying the Bible? What are the different ways in which to study the Bible? And what are the resources needed in order to study the Bible? So we went through those seven classes. And it's very important that um, if you haven't gone through those, um, to please make um, it your best effort to go through those. We do have some copies um, for that first, those first seven classes. Then we went through the Bible, or went through the Truth Project with Dr. Del Tackett, and uh, that was one of my favorite um, times to go through. We've done it twice here as a church. Hello, Neil. And um, so that was 13 lessons. It took 13 weeks, and that too is available um, for those of you that would like to go through that. And there was some before discussions and after discussions as, as, as well as the entire series. Um, and now we're moving on to fundamentals. And so the first class, we recapped the 20 weeks. Then we recapped, the best we could, the Truth Project. And then we went into the second class of, of our third course, which we covered the names, the nature, and essence of God. Okay? Tonight, we're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, so, fundamentals, we looked at last time, means foundational. And it is very important that we build a foundation because that's where we stand, is on the foundation. We cannot begin to walk or grow until we are on a foundation, and that foundation is set in the prophets and the apostles, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone or capstone that keeps all of it together because of what he's accomplished. So I've got the same exact outline as you guys have, and we're going to um, go through this together. Um, I did put together a little bit of a PowerPoint to help tonight because it is a little lengthy, and that's just who I am, but we're, we will try to get out of here by eight, okay? Not making any promises, but we will. We'll take a little bit of a break about seven, and for those that um, that cannot stay, that are getting a little bit tired, um, that need to go, do not feel obligated to stay. If you really need to go, it's completely okay. That's why we have that break at seven. Um, but for those that would like to stay, we, uh, we welcome you to stay with us. So let's begin. We're going to be on page one. Okay. So we talked about the fundamentals. We talked about the importance to, to go through those previous classes because of the knowledge of the truth will help you to be rooted and grounded in Christ, to be alive in Christ, to be hidden in Christ, and to be complete in Christ. For to live a life without him is utterly inconsistent with the scriptures. Our walk must be in a progressive path in the same direction. So where we got our title for this series is from this scripture. And that is how we came up with the title of Faith's 
path of progress, the Christian's life of service. And it is found in that one Proverbs. The path of the just is like the shining light that shines ever brighter into a perfect day. So we are justified because of the righteousness that comes from Christ, through Christ, and is imparted to us. So as we begin our study together, we have progressively been building our theology one upon another, what is called systematic theology. With each new day, we must make it our aim to enter into the most holy place and present ourselves to God as being holy and accepted to God because of his great mercy. That's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. For now, we have access to the throne of grace, being justified by faith, in what God has accomplished in and through his Son, thus being united thus being united to Christ, it should say, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can enter the throne room and kneel before our God and Father in the Son. As we bow and enter into the very presence of our King, we must align our hearts, our minds, and our will to that of his. Thus, in order to live a life that is fully pleasing to God, we must be seated spiritually with Christ in our new position, which is on the throne. That's where we are. If we're in Christ, and that's where he is, spiritually, that's where we must see ourselves. So, in order to gain God's eternal perspective on life, for both now and that which is to come, we must no longer be conformed to the world, to that old lifestyle, to the old way of thinking. We must allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds by the truth of God's word. For God has spoken to us through his word concerning life and godliness. If we are to hear from God, we must open the word of God. For it is living and active and powerful. For it is the spirit who gives life, Jesus said. The the flesh profits nothing. The spirit takes what is Christ and implants them into our hearts, meaning the word of God. For it is the truth that makes us free and transforms our lives. So, we're on page two. So this is our scripture that we are looking at. A little small. Um, That is the basis for the foundational class that we're on. Um, Pastor Kevin used this as his second message in growing. Gather, grow, and to glorify God. As we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must surrender our hearts and lives to that of Christ's authority and his rule and his reign over our lives. The Holy Spirit slowly begins to renew our thought life for the purpose of thinking our thoughts after God's own thoughts. That's the point, because our thoughts are not so great. His thoughts are perfect. So, as we slowly do that, we begin to gain God's eternal perspective. Thus, As we treasure God's command within our hearts, seeking to apply and incline our hearts to understand his will, we then begin to gain the mind of Christ. So that's a condition. We must seek to apply and to incline our hearts, treasuring God. Everything that comes out of his mouth, we must treasure it. For it is only as we embrace the wisdom that comes from his word, and it is pleasant and agreeable to our lives, do our ways begin to walk in step and align themselves in accordance with that of God's word, his will, which are both heavenly and eternal. So as we walk on this path of light and find the knowledge of God, his will for our lives, our identity in Christ becomes real and effectual. And as we continue to apply God's promise into our lives, individually we are then transformed And we begin to take on his divine nature, being conformed into the very image of Christ himself. And that is the goal of the cross. That is the goal of redemption. That's why it was set forth, is so that we might not only have his mind to know the mind of God and his will, but to take on his very nature. So, God is speaking, and he desires that we have a relationship with him through his son that is eternal life. So we have Isaiah 66, 2. For the Lord said, but to this one will I look at, graciously upon, 
to him who is humble and has a con- is in contrite in spirit, who reverently trembles at my word in awe. I believe every Christian has the choice between being humble or being humbled. Charles Spurgeon says, he says, our Lord never crushed a soul that lay prostrate at his feet. I love that verse. And Jesus went on to say in Matthew 12, 20, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Meaning when you're at your lowest and you are broken, that's when Jesus comes and he fans that flame and he will never, ever turn away someone who is broken and has a contrite spirit and is looking for God as a savior to his life. So we're on page three. So the last time we were together, we looked at the doctrine of God. So we came to find out what that word meant, doctrine. Doctrine simply means to instruct or to teach. It is to expound on a certain subject. And last time we were together, we looked at the divine nature, names, and attributes of God. We then moved on to attempt to define the names and the attributes of God. Okay? It says, the nature or attributes of God points us to the quality of God's character traits. They depict the, the distinct aspects of his features. They convey the supremacy of God's glory, his virtues, and his very essence. That's his name and the attributes of God. The character and virtues of God all point to his disposition, which convey the very essence of his being we talked about. So tonight, we are going to attempt the impossible, which is the doctrine of the divine trinity. How is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit one? So, as we began to dive into this study tonight, our doctrine on the Trinity, does anyone remember the seven keys of Bible study? We went over this last time. So, we first, we pray, which we're going to do in a second, because we can't do anything until we do pray. Okay? Pray is to ask the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our heart and give us the spirit of revelation so that he can teach and give us insights in order that we might comprehend the scriptures. That's the definition of prayer. Okay? Um, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, Jesus said. David says, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things out of your law because it's a law of love. So second, we hear. We begin hearing the word of God by sitting under it. This happens by attending church or a class like this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we know that faith is a gift. So we should read the scriptures daily. We should read for as we do, the Holy Spirit illuminates and teaches us the truth. For Jesus is the truth. The Word of God is its own self-revelation of himself. It manifests his character and the plan of salvation for all mankind. We must study the Scripture. We gain a right explanation and understanding on a passage that we are reading by diligently clarifying and then cross-referencing other parts of the Bible. We correctly interpret the Scriptures by allowing the Scriptures to explain themselves. It's not our opinion of the truth. Remember, The truth is outside of us. It must come to us, be imparted to us. And that's exactly why Jesus came. So, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, which is accurately handling the word of truth. Paul says, to study is to actively seek spiritual discernment, mature comprehension, and logical interpretation. So we memorize the Bible. We must memorize the scripture by being immersed in them until they penetrate and permeate every part of our mind with holy thoughts, fill our memory with holy associations, and govern our hearts with a holy affection for God. That's Proverbs 2. We went through that. We must treasure his commands within us. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we went through a little bit of what sin was. It's just the opposite of the very character of God. Sin's not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad for us. He knows that because it's the very opposite of who he is. So, to meditate, 
Meditate is the process by which we prayerfully reflect and ponder the meaning of the scriptures. And then to apply, finally. To apply means to exercise our faith through obedience as an act of our total submission and unconditional trust and love toward God. Seeing him who is invisible, perceiving God's word to be our absolute authority until the validity of the scriptures become an absolute reality in our daily lives. That's what it means to apply the scriptures. So we're moving on to page six. So, the doctrine of divine trinity. So before we proceed and consider the mystery of this great doctrine, we must first establish and consider this, okay? Although we can know that God exists, for by creation his power and attributes are clearly seen, and although God has spoken to us through the prophets by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thus preserving his word, which are the scriptures, and although God has spoken to us most vividly and distinctly by his Son, revealing the Father's exact character and divine nature, being in the exact image of his very person and glory, God is at the same time incomprehensible in his essence and existence. God has given us enough light and enough truth in his word for salvation and an intimate personal relationship with him. When we get to heaven, eternity, we will be learning about God because there's no end to God. God is infinite. Uh, One uh, theologian says it's like climbing Mount Everest for 10,000 years. And when you get there, there's another Everest that's going to be 10,000 more years. And then after that, another Everest for 10,000 years. That's what infinity is about. So we'll never stop learning about God, ever. Isn't that amazing that he's so infinite that we'll never stop learning about God? But on this side of heaven, we can know enough that he's given us and the light that is revealed and the truth that he has um, imparted to us for salvation, saving knowledge of who he is. So, Psalms 145.3, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So, To confess that God is eternal is to affirm that his life is infinite. We can go back as far as our mind can imagine and never arrive at the beginning, for there is no beginning nor end with God. There is no conceivable way of measuring the dimension of infinity. We looked at that a little bit last time, and I asked the question, if you had 100 people, and 100 people times infinity is what, Michael? Infinity. What's 10,000 times infinity? Infinity. So, though God is eternal, God is holy. Throughout the Old and New Testament, whenever a prophet or an apostle had a vision of God, it was always centered around God's glory and God's holiness. With each encounter that God's people had with the true and living God, their response was always the same. They were struck with a deep sense of awe, astonishment, and veneration, leaving each with a deep sense of shame, an acute sense of vileness, and a great sense of being unholy. That's what happens when you come face to face with God. These sensations are always followed by a profound awareness to repent. R.C. Sproul said, Only as we encounter God in his holiness is it possible for us to see ourselves as we really are. Are. So we're going to look at this great cloud of witnesses. We're on page six. We're going to see that when they encounter God's glory and his holiness, how it affected their lives. Okay, this is just a little rundown of Moses, of Isaiah, of David, of Peter, of John. Moses, he said, show me your glory. And God showed him his glory. And when he saw that they had committed a great sin by making for themselves a guide, a god of gold, he says, Lord, if you will not forgive their sin, then I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. That's what happens when you come face to face with God. You humble yourselves to the point where you don't even see yourself worthy. And if you see someone else sinning, You say, God, blot me out of your book if you don't forgive them. 
Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, and I heard the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. And what did he say? Wow, what a vision. No, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. David said, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And after he had sinned against Bathsheba, he said, have mercy on me, O God. Against you and you only have I sinned. Do not cast me away from your presence nor take away your Holy Spirit from me. That should be our response when we sin. Lord, forgive me. I have sinned against you and you only have I sinned. Now, there's repercussions of your sin that affects everyone around your life, but ultimately your sin is always against God. Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when that revelation finally came, he says, depart from me, I am a sinful man, Lord. The Apostle John heard, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And we are told that John saw him and fell at his feet as a dead man, as a dead man. This is always the proper response whenever we are in the presence of our holy Lord and God. If the angels cover their feet as well as cover their face in God's presence, how much more should we, since Christ died and gave himself for us? Men take off their shoes, yet angels cover their feet. We bend the knee, angels cover their face. Ought we too... know that we are on holy ground whenever we abide in the presence of the Lord. God's holiness is like that of his glory. Glory is always tied to weight. God's glory speaks of his significance, substance, and worth. God's holiness and God's glory is a dimension of God that consumes his very essence. So we're going to pray because that's what we need to see. We need to behold that kind of holiness, that kind of glory. And as we walk with him, we never need, we we should never forget that. You know, there's many names and titles for God. God is our father. We heard Pastor Jerry call him Papa, right? We should. But how do we address him when he wants to be um, addressed as Potter? Do we like to be molded and shaped, marred, using the water to soften us, that wheel of life that goes around and around, talking about our circumstances that are ever-changing? Do we like to call him Potter, or do we just like to call him Papa? There's many names for God. We must know him in all of his characters to understand who he is. People call him Savior because they want to be saved from their sin. But do they call him Lord? Lord, I need you to be governing my thoughts, my heart, my life. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you tonight and, and we ask that, um, like David, help us to see wondrous things out of your law. It is a law of love. And like Moses, show us your glory. Help us to understand what the doctrine of the Trinity really means. Help us to see you in your triuneness, one God, yet three in essence. So, Father, we ask that you would open up our hearts, the eyes of our heart that we might see. Give us that spirit of revelation that we might truly grow in knowledge. And like Pastor Kevin said, not just a theological knowledge, not an intellectual knowledge, but a heart knowledge, a life-transforming knowledge. That's what Dr. Del Tackett said. We must behold God's face, for as we do, we will be eternally affected. It's transformation that we're after. So come and transform us into the very image of your Son by beholding your Son, And do this by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are on page 7.
So as we can see, whenever a person truly encounters God's holiness and beholds God's glory, he unavoidably encounters God's absolute authority. Thus, the sovereignty of God will always have a profound impact on one's life. So, did it change? It did. Therefore, as we begin to expound on this great mystery as it pertains to the doctrine of God, or excuse me, the doctrine of the Trinity, it is vitally important that we do not use our own imaginations when it comes to describing God's nature. Instead, we ought to meditate. Don't imaginate, meditate. For we do not base God's character on how we fancy him to be, nor how we envision him to be. Idle speculation about God can be very dangerous. Because if we think that we know God in a certain way, and then we are flippant around him about our lifestyles, because we heard someone say, well, God is love. He is love. But love always tells the truth about one's condition and about one's relationship. Because it's all about relationship, what we're going to learn tonight. The Trinity is all about a relationship. And that's what he wants to have with us. So if we're going to know God in truth, we must rely on the source of truth. We must rely on what God reveals about himself and upon that which God has given us. Our only source of truth as it relates to every area of our life is to be found in God. Jesus testified that he was the truth and that he came to bear witness of the truth. Therefore, he is the source of absolute truth. He says, thy word is truth, in John 17, 17. Jesus also said that all who are of the truth, meaning born of God's nature, hear his voice. So if you're of the truth, that means you're of that same nature of God. You're no longer of the nature of Adam. You're of the nature of Christ. And you will always hear his voice saying, follow me, follow me, trust me, rely on me, know me. He came to us to prove how much it cost of what separated us. And now we can come to that throne because of what he's done. In his Son, we can know the Father by the power of the Spirit. Therefore, God is the source of truth. God's word is where we are taught the truth. And our only source of light to illuminate and clarify the truth is the spirit of truth. It is vitally important that we must understand that the entirety of God's prophetic word is complete. Very important. Though the spirit of God gives the gift of prophecy to enlighten us to the truth, which might bring about a different application because of the culture and the times that we live in, it is essential that we know that the Spirit only brings to light that which has already been written. Okay? Whatever succeeding prophecies, teachings, or revelations that fail to align itself with biblical truth as it pertains to any doctrine, subject, or topic, or counter Dixit is not of God. It's very important that you understand that. If you hear anyone teaching something that contradicts this, something that does not align itself with this, it's not of God. If it's new, it's not true. Jeremiah 6.16, Stand in the old ways and see. Ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest. For your soul. That's what we should be attaining. Rest. Entering into God's rest. Saying, you've done it all. I'm only going to respond to what you've already done now. So, Daniel 12.4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and the knowledge shall, shall be increased. So today, there are many who are running to and fro looking for some new revelation from God. Sadly, many in the church give heed to dreams and visions and to those 
who claim that God has spoken directly to them. So, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God spoke in many ways and in many portions through the prophets, but in the last days God has spoken to us by his Son. Bless you. Notice the word spoke and has spoken. These are in the past tense. God does speak to us today by the Holy Spirit, but he only speaks to us through his word, which has already been written. It's very clear when people say, I'm just going to be led by the Spirit. Well, are you walking in a way that counters God's word? Because if you are, you're not walking in the Spirit. There's no misunderstanding. The Spirit of God wrote it. The Word is what it was inspired by, and it was God Almighty in the midst of it. So, like in the beginning, God spoke, and everything came out to being, out of nothing. So you got the Spirit, you got the Word, and you got God. So it says that the Word is the wisdom of God. Does that just mean that God is wisdom by himself? Does it not say that all wisdom comes from Christ? Yes. So how do we gain wisdom? We have to have a knowledge. We have to understand the knowledge to be wise, to apply, to appropriate. So God's word is his wisdom. Same for us. We do not become wise until we first have a knowledge and understanding of what we're trying to have wisdom in, according to. So it's the Spirit of God that helps us do that according to his word. There are many in the church today that are calling themselves prophets and apostles. There are many false prophets that are seeking God's intervention. They look to social media and attempt to connect the dots through current events to that of prophecy. Unfortunately, they draw their conclusions by their own twisted views. They do not rightly interpret the scriptures with that of the scriptures themselves. In the past, there has been many false prophets that have claimed to have heard directly from God, apart from that which is declared in God's word. Joseph Smith claimed to be a prophet. He made claims that an angel had spoken to him and that he had been given special visions, even special glasses, to a fresh new revelation from God. Thus, the Book of Mormon was written, which includes another New Testament and a need of a new restoration. See what happens when we get outside of God's Word? This is what Joseph Smith said. For the Lord had given me the keys of the mystery and to those things which had been sealed even from the foundation of the world. So he took Daniel 12.4 and said, God's going to give me a fresh Revelation of something that he sealed. And yet, it says very clearly in these last days, God has spoken to us through his Son. And if we need more than the Son, we're in a sad situation. The apostle warned us much about concerning these kinds of false prophets. He said that they would worship angels. That's exactly what Joseph Smith did. They would go into detail about that vision. They would be vainly puffed up in pride by his unspiritually fleshly mind. Paul went on to say, But if we, or even an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be an anathema, a curse, forever separated from God in Christ Jesus. Jesus warned us concerning these kinds of people in Mark 13, 22 and 23. For false prophets... For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, even possible, even the elect. But take heed, says Jesus. See, I have told you all things beforehand. (laughs) I love what J. Vernon McKee says. My wife was sharing with me this the other day. Wicked people look for signs and wonders and said they ought to be listening for God's voice. For God's voice. Again, in Hebrews 1 and 1 and 2, God spoke in many ways and many portions throughout the 
through the prophets, but in his last days, God has spoken to us by his son. The reference to the prophets made here points to that of how God chose to speak to his people in the Old Testament. The reference to the son is the ultimate fulfillment as the last prophet of the new covenant. Jesus is called a prophet in Deuteronomy 18.18, the one that was to come, the prophet in John 1.21. Remember, they came. Are you the prophet? They knew what prophet was promised. And in Acts 3.22 and 23, now it's that prophet because he had died and risen and gone to heaven. But there's only one, and he is the last. Jesus Christ fulfilled the office of the supreme prophet. Christ was not only called, was not only the subject of prophecy, but the object of the prophetic message preached. So did you guys understand that? So he's not only the subject of what he was referring to, he was the very object of the message because he was the fulfillment of what they were talking about, of what he was talking about. A prophet was to speak to the people on behalf of God. Jesus did not only declare the word of God, he was the word. Jesus is the word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus spoke with the full authority of God. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the Father. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Everything that was pointing to Jesus has the words of eternal life. So we see how Christ fulfilled the office and role of a prophet, but what is the significance that Jesus is also called the apostle in Hebrews 3.1? Because he is. So as I recall, I promised you guys that when we went through the Bible basics that we would define the role, qualifications, and office of an apostle. And I apologize because I never did that. And here's a good time to do that. So as we define the qualifications of an apostle, let us test all things like the apostle says to do in the light of Holy Scripture to see if there's any apostles today. For I believe this is the reason why there is so much confusion in our day concerning sound doctrine. So... The word apostle, in its simplest terms, means one who is sent. We see this in John 6, 29. What is the work of God? It is this, believe in the one whom he sent, Jesus said. John 17, 18, as you, the Father, sent me into the world. But the word apostle, in its more complex meaning, also refers to that of one who speaks on behalf of God's authority. And we see this, too, in John 12, 49. Jesus says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Meaning that Jesus couldn't even speak unless he heard it first from the Father. He couldn't even move, it says. He couldn't even take a step unless he had had direction from his Father. In his humanity, there's no other obedience that we can even compare to other than Jesus. And if we learn about his obedience, it'll help us to learn about ours. So, there is no authority other than God. God is the ultimate authority. The Lord Jesus chose and appointed and named the 12 to be his apostles. Jesus had given them power to heal and authority to cast out demons. After the resurrection of Christ and the death of Judas, the eleven chose Matthias to replace Judas. Though Matthias was chosen by the roll of the dice, the Lord determined to appoint Paul to fill the office of Judas Iscariot. Because that's what it says in Proverbs. Man may roll the dice, but the Lord determines its outcome. Let us see how this Holy Scripture is fulfilled and is taught by God and not by man. It's very important. So the one qualifying Factor, in order to be an apostle, is one had to witness the, res the, the resurrection. We see that in Acts 1.22. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So we see clearly that that is a qualifying role of being an apostle. 
And we hear Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, 9, last of all, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles. We see in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, am I not apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, for it pleased God to reveal his son to me. So we can see there that the apostle Paul is clearly appointed as an apostle because of the qualification that he has seen the risen Savior. So another qualifying factor of an apostle was to speak on behalf of God's authority. We see this in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, says Peter, as he does in all of his epistles, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. So the apostle Peter states clearly that the apostle apostolic authority of Paul is such to that when he writes, scripture was being written because he compared it to that of the Old Testament scriptures. Let us recall that the Old Testament scriptures were referred by Jesus himself as being absolutely inspired and authoritative. So in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, it says, Ye are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation, that's what this class is all about, on what? The apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, if we look in Revelation 21, 14, here's the key verse that ties it all together. When John, the apostle John had the revelation of Jesus when he was caught up into the spirit, he saw the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And in that new Jerusalem, he said the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles. Notice it doesn't say 13, not 10, not 50. It says 12, very clearly. And this is where we stand. The word of God is the pillar and ground of absolute truth. We have no authoritative fundamental doctrine on which to base our existence nor our salvation upon other than God's inherent, written, spoken, and living word. This is where we stand as a church. So the scriptures themselves validate and clarify that was and is only 12 apostles. Anyone who calls himself an apostle today rejects the authority of God, the Holy Spirit. So that's how we know when someone says that they're a prophet or an apostle, we can say, sorry, you're not aligning yourself with the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible and says otherwise. Now, there's the gift of prophecy, and we'll get into that. But no one today is a prophet, and no one today can call themselves an apostle. The biblical canon is finalized and complete. The word canon comes from the Greek word that means a measuring rod. So it was measured, and it is a standard, because Jesus Christ is the standard. The word of God was once delivered and entrusted by God to his people, Jude says. It is the inspired, absolute, and authoritative it is a standard rule for faith and practice and is sufficient for one's salvation. There is no other prophetic word needed nor required. In Deuteronomy 4.2, it says, We are told that not to add or subtract to God's commands. In Proverbs 35 and 6, we again are told not to add to God's word. In Revelation 22, 18 and 19, we are divinely warned not to add or take away from God's word. So, the Bible is completely trustworthy and sufficient and equally efficient for all godliness in life, both in this age and that which is to come. The biblical canon is fulfilled and finished because Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies concerning himself. He achieves and satisfies the office of prophet, priest, and king, for he is the Alpha and Omega. Christ has come to satisfy the office of the supreme prophet who would bear witness and testify of the truth and give us the clearest revelation of God. As the ultimate priest, he would present the perfect sacrifice and make intercession 
on our behalf. That's how he fulfills the priesthood, the ultimate priesthood. The almighty king who reigns supreme on the throne in an everlasting kingdom, both now and forever. That's how he fulfilled his kingship. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit has been sent to fulfill prophecy of Joel in Joel 2, 28. The New Testament has been written and finalized in doctrine through the apostolic office, and the tradition of the church has testified to its validity. That's how we know that the canon is closed. So, now I know that's a little bit lengthy introduction, but I believe it was really needed, okay? Because the issue of Bible inerrancy is crucial when it comes to sound doctrine. Satan's goal is to destroy God's character, and he does it through lies. He does it through deception. When we get a half-truth, what do we get? We get a half a picture of God. That's what we get. We don't want a half a picture of God. We want the whole picture of God. We dare not lean on our understanding, especially when it comes to the weighty matters of God creating all things that have nothing, to the topic of man and original sin, which we're going to get into down the road, the reason for suffering and death, to the significance of the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus, to the ultimate consummation of all things toward which history is moving, which is heaven itself. New earth, new heavens, our home of righteousness, home of glory. That's where it's all pointing to. For God's word is the expression of his character. So we're on 13. So the doctrine of the Trinity is a weighty matter. It is mystery and majesty woven into one name. So we have the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're on question six. Michael, you want to read that? How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, in substance, equal in power and glory. Amen. So I know that Pastor Kevin actually quoted from the Westminster Confession of Faith. He said, that'll probably be the only time I do it, but it's, it really is... Uh, uh, need to go through because it gives us an idea of what we believe in. It's all it is. It's just an affirmation, really, of, of our faith. Um, so, we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. That's a, a neat little way to say it. So, what is the definition of a creed? Johnny, be good. Um, the creed is a statement of basic belief of one's faith. There you go. It is much like our formal confession of Christian beliefs, especially the Apostles' Creed. So what I've given you in the very back of this curriculum is Calvary Chapel's purpose for which it exists and our affirmation of faith. So that's in the very back of the book, and you guys... Want to go through that on your own? It's very uh, understandable of what we believe here and the purpose for why this church exists. So, the deity within the Trinity pervades Holy Scripture and is central to the gospel. It assures us that salvation is from beginning to end a divine work of God Himself. Charles Spurgeon said, When you see the Savior, remember there is a Trinity in that word the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This Savior being three persons under one name. You cannot be saved by the Son without the Father, nor the Father without the Son, nor by the Father and the Son without the Holy Spirit. But they are, as they are one in creation, so are they one in salvation, working together in harmony. As one God for salvation, unto that, God be the glory everlasting world without end, he says. So we're in page 14. So the doctrine of the Trinity is foundational to the Christian faith. As we begin our study, let us examine our facts based on the authority and truth that are contained within the Scriptures. We've gone over that, but it's very important that 
We are Bereans. Everything that is said here, what we need to do is we need to take it home and make sure that what is being taught and what's being said actually aligns himself with Holy Scripture, okay? Because on this side of heaven, even though God has given us the gift to teach and the gift to observe and the gift to interpret and the gift to apply, we still have feet of clay. We still look through this glass very darkly and dimly sometimes. And one day in heaven, we will see him face to face and he'll make everything clear. But on this side of heaven, that's why we're to study to show ourselves approved. Okay? And he does give us the Holy Spirit to allow us to, to be able to do that and not fear that we're getting it wrong. But we should always make sure that it aligns with Holy Scripture. So, the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that God is one and yet three in persons, each being fully God and yet each are clearly recognized within the Godhead as being co-existing and co-equal. Trinity comes from combining two words, tri, meaning three, and yun, meaning one. Through the term, Trinity is not found in the Bible, the concept is clearly taught throughout it. It is vital that we do not make presumptions when it comes to how we view God. There's the children's song that we often sing here. I thought about it. Um, in vacation Bible study, school. One plus one plus one equals one. And although that is a childlike faith and it needs to be taught at that kind of level, when we become mature, it actually doesn't make sense at all. That would be like separating the three. One plus one? What it should read is one plus one plus one equals infinity. Infinity. Not one, but infinity, incomprehensible. Let us no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, Paul says. He says, for when I was a child, I talked like a child and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away, I put the ways of childhood behind me. One of my favorite verses. Though the Word of God is filled with types and metaphors and imagery and allegories and parable, Millard, Eric, Mer, Millard Eric Erickson says this, We dare not attempt to use the lesser when it comes to defining the greater. God is not a metaphor. He's not a type. He's not symbolic. God is God. So we're on page 15. The doctrine of the Trinity is crucial in order to properly understand who God is that which relates to his character, his ways, his wills, his will, which points to how God relates to us. It's also crucial in order to understand how we should relate to God, includes, which includes how we ought to approach God and how we shall now live. A clear indication of the oneness of God is found in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God spoke to his people regarding how we are to worship him. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. God is holy, and he is to be worshipped based on his uniqueness and his sovereignty. He says, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 22 and 3. So we went over that a little bit last time. And what we learned was the more graphic Hebrew is in my presence or before my face, you will have no other gods. In other words, it's not putting, it's, it's when you're in the presence of God and, and, you're, and you're worshiping another God, you're, you're, putting it, you're putting that other God before his face because his eye is on you. You are the pupil of his eye. Because there is only one God, he is entitled to our exclusive worship, obedience, and devotion. God's oneness relates to his lordship, and that's why we call him Lord. God's sovereignty is demonstrated in the fact that he is in control over all things, including those things we worship. When the Lord destroyed the gods of Egypt, he was once again proving that these were not gods. Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. We went over that a little bit last time. So they're fallen angels. We worship the gods of this and that, 
but they're actually fallen angels. Once we understand that, we understand idolatry, we understand false gods, and we understand they're just a fallen angel lying to us, deceiving us, changes our perspective. The Apostle Paul equated false gods to that of demons in 1 Corinthians 10.20. Pastor Kevin taught us on that when he went through 1 Corinthians. Galatians 4.8, when you did not know God, you served those which were by nature not gods, meaning that these so-called gods were created in angels, not gods. They didn't have that nature of God, but we worship them as gods. They have never earned nor deserved the right to be served nor worshipped as gods. Here we see in the New Testament validating the Old Testament and vice versa. We must interpret the scriptures with the scriptures themselves. The scripture opposes the view that there are other created beings that are equal to God. Nothing is equal to God. We're on 16. We're going to take a little bit of a break after this. So, the revealed truth points us to the fact that God is sovereign over all things. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God's beside, God beside me. I put to death, I bring to life, I wound, I heal, and there is no one that can deliver out of my hand, says God. So I gave you another reference there in Deuteronomy 4, 32 to 33, 35, excuse me. So the Lord was declaring by his action that he is the only one who can save us from our enemies. We went over that last time. What are our enemies? Gabe, do you remember our enemies? Um, uh, uh, Satan. Satan, good. Michael? Satan? The flesh. The flesh. Adam? Uh, uh, idols. Good, which is in the world. Amen. Amen. So you got flesh, the devil, and the world. So, in Isaiah 43, 11, 12, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared, I have saved, I have proclaimed that there be no foreign God among you. That's why he does what he does. Because he knows they're fallen angels. They're not gods. Again, this is reiterated in the Song of Moses. Whom among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Each person of the Godhead exists under the full essence of deity. So, what is the definition of deity? Grace? Right there on the page. Mm, don't call on me. Butch? What's the definition of deity? Divine and being with relates and one's nature. There you go. So, the biblical definition of the Lord God is that he is holy. The word for holy literally means to be separate or to be set apart. That's what the definition of holy means. So, when Peter says, be holy for I am holy, what is he saying? Be set apart. Be set apart. Because I set you apart. Now be set apart. That's what it means. When God declares that he is three in persons, he is not stating that he is three separate gods. That would be tritheism. You see, he's one God in three persons, fully God. Okay? So, what is poly? Theism. Wait. Um, is, it is the belief in worshiping multi, multi gods. Multi, multi gods, right. So, what is pantheism? TJ. It's the belief that all is God and all religions worship the same God. That all roads lead to heaven. Monotheism is the belief in one God. Now, let's not confuse this. Islam is monotheism. Buddhists are monotheism. The sheikhs are monotheism. However, Christianity is detached and severed from all forms of religion. This is what 
we believe. We believe that God is one God in being, identical and indistinguishable in nature, substance, and essence, and yet distinguished in three persons, God the Eternal Father, God the Eternal Son, and God the Eternal Spirit. So, thank you guys for so much for being patient tonight. So it's about 7.04. We're going to take a five-minute break. Um, let's just take a little five-minute break and try to get out of here at 8 o'clock. So if you guys want to stretch your legs or use the restroom real quick, um, we'll just meet back here in about five minutes, okay? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> see, every time we say praise the Lord, there's an echo. Thank you, Jesus. I was waiting for that on, on Wednesday night because Jerry kept saying, praise the Lord, and I kept waiting for Wade to say, thank you, Jesus. Okay, we're on page 17. <laughs> the term person, when used within the Godhead, does not imply a distinction in essence, but rather a difference within the life and being of God. So I don't like the word distinct. Some theologians say he is one in essence, but he is dis, you know, distinct in person. Distinct basically means that, what does it mean to you, Johnny, that you are distinct? That means you're separate, yeah. right? Well. Yeah, exactly. So distinct means separate. Amen. So I choose the word, I like to use the word um, identified in three. So we see in number 6, 22 and 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So Brackle says this, safekeeping is ascribed to the Father. The manifestation of grace is ascribed to the Son and the bestowal of peace is ascribed to the Holy Spirit because he's the one that ties us to the Prince of Peace. This blessing was to be spoken over the children of Israel to invoke the name of God, three in one, especially as it relates to the covenant of grace. So as we noted last time, we were together when we studied God's names and attributes. God has chosen to disclose his divine nature to us through his names. Elohim is the plural firm, form which expressive, expressively refers to to that of two or more. Thus, we ought to be fully convinced with our own minds that Elohim points us to the Trinity. It is clearly taught throughout the Holy Scripture by the Holy Spirit that though God is one, in essence, his, he subsists in three persons. Subsist just means that he lives. The Trinity is made evident in which God refers himself, himself to be more than two. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In Genesis 1.26, we just went through that with Pastor Kevin. Let us go down and confuse their language. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us, says God in Isaiah 6.8. And then we see this. But to the Son, the Lord says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed you. In Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and with power. So, as we see here, we see that the divinity and identity within the Trinity and what distinguishes each person. First, we hear the Father saying to the Son, thy throne attributing to the throne to his son in Hebrews 1.3. Second, the father declares Jesus to be co-equal with himself, saying, thy throne, O God. He calls Jesus God. And if the father calls Jesus God, who are we to dispute? God. Third, we see the Holy Spirit proceeding from the father, anointing the son to give his life as a ransom. This was fulfilling the prophecy spoken by Daniel in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And you guys can have that for a reference because this is on the Trinity. But we can see clearly that there's all three in the Trinity in that statement. So we're on page 18. The doctrine of the Trinity is doubtless one of the greatest of mysteries. 
It is the mystery of the Godhead. Each person within the Godhead are coexisting and co-equal. We have said whenever the scriptures portray the Trinity as always refers to three identified persons. Within the existence of each person of the Godhead dwells the full essence of the divine, each possessing an undivided attribute of complete deity, all three being all-powerful in glory, all-knowing in wisdom, and ever-present in holiness. Each person within the Trinity are one, identical and indistinguishable in nature, substance, and virtue. The essence of God is essentially the nature of God. It speaks of God's character. So, as we consider each person within the Godhead, we should not think that they have roles or duty. That signifies obligation, but rather that they are they have functions within themselves. You see, that signifies a relationship. So duty and roles is obligation, but functions signifies a relationship. Though there is a distinction within the tri excuse me, though there is no distinction within the triune nature of God, there is a distinction within the actions that are done within the Trinity for the sake of redemption. All three assume different op operations within the Godhead. Thus, each person of the Godhead are distinguished by the work of redemption agreed upon by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The work of creation and the work of salvation is the mighty work of God. The Father planned and initiated creation and redemption through an everlasting covenant. We will get into that next time we get together, called the covenant of redemption. The Son is sent to fulfill the plan and redeem creation through the covenant in his blood. The Holy Spirit is sent to execute, accomplish, and apply redemption through regeneration. So, the doctrine, as we said, is called the covenant of redemption. And uh, we will expound more on that the next time we get together. We're on page 19. Though God is incomprehensible for us to contain... We can know God to the degree that he has chosen to reveal himself. We must work within the light that God has chosen to reveal himself. And what is that? The word of God, Brackle says. That the Father is God is not much disputed among religious groups. Most people know that he is God. It is said of the Father that in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. He is one God, or excuse me, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, they say, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. It is said that God so clothes the grass of the field in Matthew 6, 26, excuse me, 6, 30. It is said that our heavenly Father feeds the birds of the air. God knows when the deer gives birth, he even knows the path of the lightning bolt. He gives majestic strength to that of the horse. God sends and withholds rain. He gives life and takes it away. He commands the morning and the dawn. He even tells the ocean waves, this far you may come, but no further. Most people believe that about God. But the indisputable proof that the Son is the second person of the Trinity is much debated in religious groups. So here is a key verse to the deity of Jesus Christ, and it's found in Philippians 2, 6 and 7. So if you'd like to turn in your Bible to Philippians 2 and 6, we'll kind of expound on this just a little bit, take our time. It's very, very important. So I'm just going to read the scripture really quickly, um, starting at Six, actually we'll go back up to five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now that is the New King James Version. This version that we're using on the paper here or on the screen is the 
ESV, and I think I even use the NASB to give a clear understanding. So, who being in the very nature of God, what does that mean? It means that the Son of God is one in essence. It speaks of his nature. So he had the nature of God. He did not consider it equality with God, meaning that the Son of God is co-equal with God. Equality means equal. So he did not consider himself that that equality would matter. Something to be grasped, he said, meaning that through the incarnation, the Son never lost his deity. But he emptied himself. Now, what does that mean? The Son of God sets aside his privileges as God Almighty, as it pertains to his attributes. Taking on the form of a bondservant, what does that mean? Not to be served, but what? To serve and to give his life a ransom. Born in the likeness of men, meaning the Son of Man shared in our humanity, clothed himself with flesh and blood. And being found in human form, meaning that he was fully man, tempted in all ways like us, yet without sin. He humbled himself still further, becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christ offered himself once for sin. He is the mediator of the new covenant. By means of his death, Jesus obtained eternal redemption for those who place their faith in him. So we can understand a little bit more of when, he, when Paul says, let this mind be in you. Meaning that we should, we should not look at ourselves and say, but I don't want to lose my identity in order to become something else for a greater cause. If Jesus never lost his identity, but he humbled himself because he did not consider what he had. He wanted a desire of his Father's will, which was to become made like us so that we might become made like him. And every time we do that same, we have that same mind. Lord, I must decrease. You must increase. I want to humble myself to the point of knowing you in the likeness of your death so that I can walk in the power of your resurrection so other people get saved. That's exactly what Jesus did, except he went to the cross and died. We don't, he doesn't want a living, he wants a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. It's easy to walk out and have one time sacrifice and die, but to die daily, you have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. So we're on page 20. So the dominant theme throughout Holy Scripture is the person and work of the Lord Jesus, culmination on the cross of Christ. In his humiliation, he dedicates himself to fulfill redemption, thus glorifying the Father. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us, says Paul in 1 Timothy 2.5. Though on the surface level, this may appear to separate the Son from the Father. But as we dig a little deeper, we will clearly see that in the Old Testament, the Lord was teaching and declaring this in Ezekiel 22.30. So I sought for a man among them who would stand in the gap before me, but I found none. Isaiah 59.16 and 17. He saw that there was no man. He was amazed that there was no one interceding. Interceding is the job or the role of a priest. And Jesus came to fulfill the ultimate priesthood, always interceding on behalf of us. Therefore, by his own arm, he brought salvation. And his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and salvation like a helmet on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a cloak. That's where Paul gets Ephesians 6, by the way. That armor is not ours. It's his to give. And it all speaks of Christ. Salvation, righteousness, helmet of salvation, the sword, the shield, the gospel. It's all Christ. That's where he gets it from. So the cloak mentioned here is none other than the word becoming flesh. He cloaked himself. No one recognized him. 
He came in human form. Like Pastor Kevin said on Sunday, they were looking for a conquering king, not a suffering sacrifice. Hosea 13.4, Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no other God but me, for there is no Savior but me. Jesus came to save us. And God is saying that he is the Savior. So it is said of the Father, sorry, it is said of the Father that he is one God and Father of us all in Ephesians 4, 4 and 6. It is said of the Father that he will dwell and walk among us in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. It is said of the Father that God himself will be with us and be our God in Revelation 21, 3. But it is said of the Son that he is sent by the Father. It is said that the Son comes forth from the Father. It is said of the Son that he will dwell among us, Emmanuel, God with us. It is said of the Spirit given by the Father. It is said of the Spirit, he proceeds from the Father. It is said of the Spirit of the Father, he sends the Spirit in the Son's name. The Spirit will convict the world of sin, God's righteousness, and future judgment. Thus, the Spirit will bear witness and glorify the Son. So, should we look at the Old Testament God and the New Testament Savior Jesus and try to separate them? When we see here that they are one, that their will is one, their purpose is one, that the very God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. They are one in purpose and heart, in nature and essence. So when you think of the Old Testament God, you say, he was a judgmental God. He was a God of wrath. We see that Jesus is one of the same. God was a God of mercy in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ fulfills it. God is a God of grace giving us Jesus Christ's ultimate favor. God is a God of righteousness and wrath. He poured out his indignation and wrath upon his son, which was our sin placed upon him. Jesus is just fulfilling the very nature of God. We should never try to separate the Old Testament God of vengeance and the New Testament Christ, our God, who is Lord and Savior. Never try to separate them because Scripture doesn't, and they are one. That's what we're studying tonight. It's the Trinity. It's on page 21. It is said of the Father that he is eternal, omnipotent, and omniscient. We went over those last time we were together. What is omnipotent? Gabe, do you remember what omnipotent is? All-powerful. Omniscient? is all-knowing, all-knowing. Omnipresent is everywhere present. So these virtues are ascribed to the true and living God, okay? Yet, let's even get this thing to work. There we go. <laughs> Yet these are attributed to the Son of God during his earthly ministry, being filled with the Spirit. According to the Word of God, the Word was God, Excuse me, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Son has always eternally existed with the Father. That makes him eternal. We go on to Luke 5:22. Knowing what they were thinking, Jesus replied, "What do you think? Why are you thinking these things in your hearts?" Again, omniscient. He was knowing what they were thinking. Makes the Son omniscient by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice in John 11, 43, 44, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, proving that he was omnipotent, that the power of God was given to him to raise the dead. And that's why he says, I am the resurrection and the life in John eleven twenty five. 25. So, in the Old Testament, God the Father is accredited to creating and sustaining the world. You 
are the Lord. You made the heavens, the earth, the seas. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships him. Nehemiah 9, 6. But we see Jesus is in the image of the invisible God. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him they are held together. They, ex- they consist. So we see the same exact God. The Son is attributed to that of creation as well as sustaining it by the word of his power. So it's clearly noted in the Old Testament that only God can forgive sin. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, says David. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. But as we see Jesus in Luke 7, 48 and 49, then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven you. But those that were at the table said, who is this that can forgive sins? And that's one of the reasons why they crucified him, because he claimed to be God who forgave sins. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. And the man got up and walked home to prove that he was God of very God. So we're on 22. The very greatness of God, demonstrated by the eternal power of redemption, now made manifest in the gospel, entails the vastness of God's multi-layered, multi-sided wisdom and power displayed within the divine inner life of the Godhead. So whenever we say that someone is born, we do not say that he or she was made manifest, do we? No. But when the Son of God came into the world, the Apostle John proclaimed in John 1, 18, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he, that is Jesus, declared or manifested or revealed him, God Almighty. This does not imply that Jesus was not born of a woman, but what it does imply is that Jesus was already the eternal Son and was manifest in the flesh at that time. For that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. Of meaning same nature, Matthew 1.20. The phrase of the Holy Spirit is in reference to whoever is born of God, meaning Jesus was born by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the seed of his Father. The significance, meaning that Jesus was born having the same divine nature and yet was fully man. The Trinity has always been and will always be be eternal. There has always been three within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Often we ask, what exactly does the Apostle Paul mean when he refers to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever wondered that? Why does he call him God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? 2 Corinthians 11, 31. Though Jesus has always been and will always be the eternal son. The reference made here is to the, that specifically of Jesus' incarnation. He called him God. He called him Father. Because in his humanity, he looked to him as a father and to his only God. Okay? The covenant of redemption, or the council of grace, was initiated as the word became flesh. Jesus came as the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, testified to be the Son of God, proving that God is with us. Within the great mystery of the Trinity, before the Son was begotten of the Father, stands the Son who was already the only begotten of the Father. I was brought forth when there was no fountains abounding, says Proverbs 8, 24. The incarnation was not the result of Jesus becoming the Son. He has always been the Son of God by virtue. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy three sixteen. So the indisputable proof that the second person within the Trinity is the Son of God is to be found in his divine names, attributes, 
works, and in the exalted honor that he now receives. Many things are attributed to Christ, much like we studied last time in the names of God. Okay? Jesus has many, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, Emmanuel, lamb of God, master, Messiah, mediator, shepherd, savior. Though these titles signify Christ's character, they do not always relate to his eternal sonship. He is called the son based on his work as a son, whom the Lord has possessed in the beginning of his way, before his works of old, speaking of creation. Proverbs 8.22. Much like the name the Son of Man that refers to his earthly ministry and his mediatorial work, praying for us as a mediator, the names of Christ is also represented, represents him being the eternal Son of Glory. He says, he is called the branch, the day spring from on high, the image of the invisible. These all point and speak of his incarnation. And now the sovereign Lord has sent me with his spirit. There's all the Trinity in one verse. Isaiah forty-eight sixteen. The son did not become less than the father during his earthly ministry, for Paul expressed by the inspiration of the Spirit, that the person of Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. I should say from, sorry about the misspelling there, in Romans 1.14. And yet it was expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not for the whole nation, that the whole nation should perish. That was actually a, a God giving a prophecy through that a man in John 11.50. The eternal Son subjected himself to the Father's will, becoming obedient to death on the cross. Only when he who knew no sin became sin was there a separation within the Godhead. It was the first and last time. For God, who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not now, with his Son, give us all things? Romans eight thirty-two. So the unity within the Trinity is compared to that of the root and a shoot, the spring and a river, the sun and its light. These are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and there are three that testify on earth. What are they? The Spirit, the water, and the blood, 1 John 5, 7, 8. This is in reference to the validity of Christ's humanity when water and blood came forth from the wound of his side after his death, proving himself to be fully man. When he says, I've given up my spirit, and then water and blood came forth, proving that he was fully God and fully man because he died. So the Trinity is a settled doctrine. So we have seen the Son is one in essence and is attributed to being all-knowing, all-powerful, that all things were made through him and for him, that he that all things are held together by the word of his power and that he has the authority to forgive sin. And the list can go on all night long if we wanted to. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, walked on water, raised the dead back to life. He healed lepers, cast out demons, proving that whoever has seen him has seen the Father. Thus, we see the Son proceeding from the Father, that the grace of God might be revealed. That's one of the reasons why he came, okay? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, Titus 2.11. Thus we see the Son proceeding from the Father, that the love of God might be revealed. But when the kindness and the love of God toward man appeared, that was another reason why he came, grace, love, okay? That makes sense? God sends his word as an object of praise. The Son is ever the manifestation of the Father. He is the radiance and only expression of God's glory, the exact representation and perfect imprint of the Father's essence. We read that in Hebrews 1.3. For God was pleased to have all the fullness of deity in him. Deity meaning God Almighty. 
For in him, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, meaning that he was walking in the flesh in bodily form. Colossians 2.9. As the Son, he has accomplished redemption through his sinless sacrifice. As, excuse me, as the Son of Man, he has accomplished redemption through his sinless sacrifice. As the Son of God, he can offer forgiveness of sins and salvation through his precious blood. As the king of righteousness, in his exalted position, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ Jesus shall judge the whole world. 1 Timothy 4, 1. The Lord Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. So we're on page 25. The third person of the Trinity is called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of Grace. Those are his titles. The Holy Spirit is, again, co-equal, co-eternal to that of both the Father and the Son. For he was present at the very beginning. He is portrayed as being subject, however, to the Father and to the Son. The third person of the Trinity is also called the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Truth, and the breath of the Almighty in Job 33, 4. So thus, whenever the Spirit is working with the Word of God, He is literally breathing life into us. Spirit is the breath of God by which God's Word creates life. It is here that we see the Trinity. Psalm 36, 6. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. So you got God the Father, the Lord, the Word, Jesus, by the breath, the Ruach of the Holy Spirit. You got the Trinity. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, says Jesus. Life-giving, life-creating, the power of endless life. That's what happens every single time we read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is breathing His Word into our lives. We get born again, how? By the living and abiding Word of God. How do, we, how do we get edified? We're washed by the Word of God every single day. How are we transformed? By the Spirit, looking and beholding the glory of God by the Spirit. How are we renewed in our minds? Renew your minds. How? By the Word of God. It's all a picture of the Trinity's working in us and through us. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That's old covenant. And what, and what did he find? <laughs> There's none righteous, no, not one. That's why he sent his son. Revelation 3.1 says, The seven spirits is a tribute to that of the Holy Spirit. Because seven... And the Bible is always a picture of perfection. The Holy Spirit will take what is Christ and declare it to us in John 16, 14. God saves us how? By his name. For his name's sake. Psalm 23, 3. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's name. When he comes, you will call him Jesus and he will save you from your sins. The Holy Spirit not only regenerates us at the conception of our faith, but God imparts to us the Spirit which unites us to Christ forever. Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us his Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So you see, there's all three in one verse doing the functions and operations of God Almighty. So this brings us to an application here. When we pray, who do we pray to? Since there's three. Right? And what does it mean to pray in the Spirit. 
because Paul talks about that, pray in the Spirit. So to pray in the Spirit is to pray alongside of the Spirit, is to come alignment with Him, meaning in accordance with that of His Word, in accordance with that of God's will. It says if, any, if you ask anything according to God's will, it will be what? Done for you. So as we pray in the Spirit, we're praying according to His will, according to His Word. That's what it means to pray in the Spirit. Who do we pray to? We pray to God the Father. Through Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, in His name, meaning aligning with His name. Every part of His name, His essence, His will, His character, every part of who he is. That's what it means to pray in his name, is to be in accordance with his essence, character, and attributes of his divine revealed will. Because he has given us his spirit as a guarantee that we have access to God our Father in the Son. So we're on page 26. We see here that the Trinity again. First Peter 1 and 2 chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. You have the Trinity right there in one verse. Thus within the Godhead exists the undivided in divided persons. It's my, paradox, my, my, my one paradox for the night, okay? You have the undivided in divided persons. Thus, Whenever the Son or the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, undertakes an operation, it is not three actions, but one action in which all three are involved. Does that make sense? Okay. It says, we who are born of God are grafted into the true vine, because it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. So born of God means to be born of that same nature, into the true vine. Remember, he came to die. He says if he died, he would bear much fruit. That is the tree of life. We are simply grafted in to the vine as a branch. It says if anyone abides in him, he is a branch and he will bear much fruit. The branch does not bear the fruit. The branch abides and lets the Holy Spirit work through the branch to produce love and joy and peace and patience and goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You're just a branch because you're grafted into the vine. My dad used to... He used to blow me away. We had apple trees, and we had different kinds of apple trees. And he would go out, and he would graft one apple tree into the other apple tree. I think Pastor Kevin talked about this. And it was amazing that we had crab apples, and we had um, galleys in the same tree. You could go out and eat two, two or three different kinds of apples on the same tree. And I always wondered, how in the world did he do that? And he wasn't a believer, because he would have said, well, how in heaven is the correct Ask the correct, the correct um, question to ask that, because only God can do that. And I believe he did that, because as we look at some parts of nature, we can see that we can be grafted into a tree and produce fruit from the same root. It's amazing. So, continuing on. The Holy Spirit is characterized by his position. His purpose is that we partake of the divine nature and bear fruit to God through regeneration. He imparts gifts and eternal blessings by executing the finished work of the cross of Christ. He then brings about the end of our salvation, which is the final consummation of the Father's plan, to what? To present us to himself as a spotless bride for who? His Son, which is the eternal inheritance of the saints. For God did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not now with him? Give us that blessing. That's why he came. Remember when in Genesis says that when he took Eve from Adam, it says he presented Eve to Adam as a wife. That's what he's going to do with us. 
a spotless virgin wife. We talked about that last time. How do we remain a virgin in Christ? I know that's kind of a hard concept for us to to conceive of, but it's true. If, If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from how many sins? All sin. That's how we continue to be a spotless bride in his presence. We confess that which we know of, and he enlightens us to that darkness, to that sin. And we simply walk in the light and say, you are God, I'm not, and you reveal that to me, and I hate it because that's of my old nature, that's not who I am. Thank you for revealing that to me, I confess it. To confess is to forsake. To admit is not confession. Big difference. If we just admit we're wrong, if I admit that I'm wrong to my wife, I can easily do the same thing over and over and over. If I confess my sin to my wife and say, I hate that. I hated the way I treated you. I hated the way I spoke to you. I will never do it again. I will turn from that way of life because it degrades you and belittles you and makes you of little worth in my eyes. That's confession. Big difference between admitting you're wrong and confessing that you are wrong. Okay? So... All these things refer to those things which pertain to spiritual life and godliness and salvation. Thus, within the Trinity, we see that God is love. Augustine made the observation that in order to say that God is love, it implies that there must be the lover, the object love, and the love that unites them. God is the great lover. We are the object love, and the thing that unites us is the cross. Jesus is the eternal Son, the only begotten of the Father, agreeable with the nature of the Father. Even if this reference to the eternal Son was only made once, it would be sufficient for us to believe that Jesus... <laughs> I'm not going to do this again. That Je- that, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have eternal life through his name. That's the whole purpose of why I believe that God inspired Pastor Kevin to go back to the gospel of John. Because that's where we are as a church. There's so many new believers that are coming in that are, that are just barely tasting and seeing that God is good. But they haven't really truly received him as the Christ, as the Lord and Savior. The Son has life in himself. Life originates from him. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, says Jesus in 10.28. We cannot fully understand the depth to which Jesus suffered when God poured out his life, excuse me, when God poured out his indignation upon his Son, his only Son. But someday when we see God, we shall see him as he is. It says, as when we see him, we will see him as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We will understand that in the mind of God, before he ever created anything, his plan was the covenant of redemption. In the council of peace, he said, this is going to happen. This is the way it's all going to work out. It's not plan B. It's not plan C. It's always been plan A. And it was in the mind of God before he ever created an angel, before he ever created anything, because that's how big God is. Until then, those aspects in which we cannot fully comprehend should be regarded as mysteries that go beyond our temporary reason of time. So I've attempted here to demonstrate, and this is not going to be big enough, I'm sorry. I've attempted to demonstrate, though rather poorly, to offer us an illustration that best describes the nature and relation of the Trinity. So we have God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, okay? So in the middle there, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, The Son glorifies the Father, the Father and the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son, and they all, both together, glorify the Father. Maybe I said that backwards. The Son glorifies the Father, the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son, and all three glorify the Father. The Son is not the Father. 
The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. However, the Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. The Father is in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the Father. The Son is in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in the Son. Now, that might be a little confusing, but it's very important to understand that. Okay? While each of the persons in the Godhead are one in essence in deity, the three subsist or live within one being, yet each have their identity within the Godhead. That's why they're not, that's why the Father is not the Son. You see, the Holy Spirit, I mean, the Father is never said to be poured out upon the church. The Holy Spirit is to be poured out upon the church. The Father did not die. Jesus died. While each of the three persons of the Godhead are clearly distinguished and all three are co-equal and have always been co-existings in one essence and one in being, that's why they're in each other, dwelling in. They can never be separate from one another. So the, the reference to the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and so on. The Son is not the Father. The Spirit dwells within you and will be in you. So Jesus was actually standing there, the eternal Son of glory. And he says, the Spirit's with you, meaning that he's in me, he's with you. He was making a reference to he that has seen the Father has seen me. But here he's saying, he who has seen me has seen the Spirit of God. He'll be in you. He says, I will come to you. I won't leave you orphans, meaning that he's called the Spirit of Christ. He's one with the Spirit. He, that is God, will show him, the Son, greater works than these, that you may marvel, for as the Father raises the dead, even so the Son of God. And what did Jesus do? He raised Lazarus from the grave after four days, proving that he that has seen me has seen the Father. But yet, he was here. The, God, the Father was in heaven. But you can't separate them, ever. You can't separate their essence, their will, their nature, their power. But yet they are three in one. Three in one. The Son is the radiance and the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. I and my Father are one, we said. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. There's the Trinity again. The Son is glorified by the Father. The Father is glorified by the Son. The Son has his glory from the Father, and the only begotten thus becomes the glory of the Spirit. Faith completes the circle as he gives us the gift of faith. We in Christ glorify the Son by the means of the Spirit and the Father by the means of the Son. So, and that's why we should never confuse the God of the Old Testament to the God of the New, because they are the same in essence, nature, and character. So I hope that didn't confuse you. I know that is a little bit deep there, but take it home, meditate on it, study it, because I believe it will help you to understand the Trinity. They are one in essence, and yet they are three in identified persons. The person within the Godhead, Brown 28, are neither different nor separate from each other, but are one in the same. There has never been an alteration in the nature of the Trinity. God is and will be what he has always been. There is one truth that we must be firmly acquainted with when it comes to the will of God and our salvation. We're almost done. Justification is instant, okay? It is the mighty work of God through the Son. We are justified by God on the basis of what Christ has done as our substitute. Jesus was punished and took our place, becoming an offering on account of our sins. Jesus was punished and took our place by becoming an offering on account of our sins. God's righteous judgment upon sin has now been revealed where? On the cross. 
As we trust and place our faith in Christ's finished work on our behalf, God imputes his son's perfect righteousness to our account. That's why it's instant. Faith is the means, and faith is a gift. But what we must receive is that gift of faith. That's why it says anyone who's believed and received has the power or authority to become the children of God. Our part is receiving. The gift of faith is his to give. We now have forgiveness of all of our sins. Thus, we are saved from sin's guilt and penalty. That's why he says we are saved by his name. His name is Savior. He will save them from their sins. The first place that we are saved from is the guilt and the penalty of our sin. The penalty, eternal death, spiritual death. So we see here the doctrine of justification is also in the Trinity. The judgment of God the Father upon sin, the atoning work of the Son by which God justifies, and the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify. Sanctification is a long journey in the same direction. It's important that you know that. That's all it is. It's a long journey in the same direction. Though we fall seven times, God picks us up. He follows us with what? Mercy. All the days of my life. Goodness and mercy. He picks you up. But it's a long journey in that direction because that direction goes toward heaven. If you're going in that direction, you're going in the direction of that, of the flesh, the world, and the lies, the devil. So we're always going toward that direction, which is led by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit always leads us in the path for who? For his namesake, to the glory of grace is working in our lives, that we can never earn, we don't deserve, and we certainly don't merit by walking in that direction. We're simply just responding to the grace that's been given to us, that has been revealed, which is the love of God, which we looked at. It is the mighty work of God, the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is, in its simplest terms, means to be what? Set apart. Again, be holy for I am holy. And holy means to be set apart. That's what sanctification means. Be set apart from your old way of lifestyle, your old thoughts. Be set apart from that of the world and the way that it's going. Be set apart from the lies of the devil that's trying to deceive you. Be set apart from your flesh that is wanting and desiring to gratify its own desires that it used to be desired with. And now present yourself to righteousness, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in that leading. Walk in that good path. Walk in the light that's revealing himself to you as light, as that truth. You see, God has taken us out of this world by, be, by being united to Christ's death. That's how he's taken us out. There's only one way out of this world. What's that? Death. Praise the Lord, he's done it for us by being our substitute. We were united to him. When he died, we died. We come, to, we come to life, alive unto God. There's one way out of this world, and that's through death. But there's one way to an everlasting world, and that is in Christ or through Christ. God has done this through a new and living way by being united to Christ's resurrected life. Only as we submit fully to the Lord Jesus Christ and draw from the power of the Holy Spirit are we saved from what? the power of sin, though we live in the presence of sin. That was the battle that Paul was going through. He goes, though I live in the presence of sin, I sin. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I praise the Lord Jesus. He's the one that delivered me. How does he deliver us? By allowing him to deliver us by living his life through us. That's how we get delivered from the power of sin. Thus, we are no longer of the world, though we live in the world. So we're living in it. That's the presence of sin. But we're no longer of it because we're of a different kingdom, serving a different king. We're not under that dominion anymore of the old. We're of a new everlasting dominion, seated spiritually with Christ, where? On a throne of glory. He's ruling, he's reigning. It must be real in our lives. And the only way that it is, is through an act 
of complete reality and submission and saying, I trust you. I don't understand it. My flesh is contrary to it. My desire is contrary to it. Everything I think is contrary to it. And that's why he says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Knowledge gives us an understanding so that we might become wise and make wise choices because eternity is sake. He says, what does it matter if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Eternity is a sake, and he's given us a new and living way through Jesus Christ. And he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to make us holy, meaning to set us apart from that of the old way of life and the old way of thinking. Sanctification is called the good fight of faith. It's a marathon. It's likened to that of a race. This path is progressive and is built where? Where we're building it, this foundation. That's why we're going through these classes. The next time we get together, we're going to talk about the covenant redemption. We're going to talk about the creation of the worlds, meaning the unseen world and the seen world. We're going to look at angels, good and bad. We're going to move on to the doctrine of man. Sin, where it originated. What happened after, before the fall? What happened after the fall? We're going to go into all these details because this is where we gain a right understanding and a perspective so that our priorities in life are correct. The reason that we don't live is because we have the wrong priorities in life because we do not know our right perspective on death. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, we see the Trinity again. God from the beginning chose you for salvation. How? Through the sanctification, setting you apart. How? By the Spirit in belief of what? The truth. Jesus said, I've come for this reason, to testify the truth. To which he called you by the gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of the Lord is in consummation when we are at that wedding table married to the lamb. So we're on page 29. For God's word testifies to the purpose of why Jesus was revealed and manifested. Here we go. The Lord Jesus said, for this cause I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. We went through that. Of the same nature, born of the same spirit, not of flesh, not of the will of man, but of God you are born again, John says. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Why? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Meaning, the, word, the works of the devil is basically having the spirit of antichrist, being anti-Jesus, <laughs> doing everything anti, instead of for. Now, again, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory, a position of the throne that's already won the battle, reigning and ruling by, the, by King Jesus. And that is why, dear precious ones, we are to take captive every deceiving lie that attempts to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. We are to put to death the deeds and desires of the flesh. We fight this good fight of faith, how? In the power of the Spirit. That's how Jesus did it. That's in Luke 4.14. 4, it says the Spirit drew him into the wilderness and tested him, and he said he overcame in the power of the Spirit. That's how we are to win every single battle, by the power of his might. It's the Holy Spirit. If Jesus needed it and his, human, his hum, humanity, how much more should we need it? That's why he's an example as the Father sent me, I now send you with the same Holy Spirit because you can't do it without him. Try living the Sermon on the Mount and turning the other cheek or looking at a woman or a man in lust. That's why he says, if you do, cut out your right eye. Cut out your right hand. Cut off your left foot. What is the right a symbol of? Authority. Where's Jesus seated? at the right hand of God, which is what? The authority of God. So our right is our authoritative. 
And if we say, I have authority to do my own right and to do my own will and to look at that in a way that I shouldn't, he says, take that authority and cast it from you because now you're under a sovereign king. If your right hand says, wants to do something that's contrary to the word of God, take it off because it is a position of authority. And I want you to be under my authority, ruling and reigning, governed by God. If your foot causes you to walk that way, contrary to God, because I have my own rights, my own will, cut it off so that you're always walking in the way of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. That's what the application is, okay? It's not physically taking out an eye or cutting off your hand. It's about cutting off that right of authority. If anyone denies himself and picks up his cross and follows me, he is my disciple. If not, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. A house divided cannot stand, and we are God's house. Praise the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we no longer have to be conformed by the influences, power, authority, and dominion of the word, which is temporary and passing away. We either have the nature of the devil or of the truth. What voice are we listening to? Can we honestly say, I hear a lot of people say something that is contrary to the truth, and then they say, well, God's in control. How many people have you heard that say that? They'll say something contrary to God's will, and then they'll say, but God is on the throne. If we are not under his authority and allowing him to govern our thought life and our heart life, should we say that God is in control if we assume the reins or demand our own rights to follow after the world or the flesh or the lying, deceiving work of the devil? We should never say that God is in, on the throne when we're walking contrary to God because he's not on the throne of our hearts. He's still on the throne, but he's not on the throne of our hearts because we're not there with him, allowing him to rule and reign and govern our life. That was the transaction with Jacob. Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, governed by God. He wrestled with God. We all have to go through that wrestling. But at one point, we will be humbled, or we will humble ourselves, choose the latter. Because there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, when Ezekiel walked down to the potter's well, to see what was on it, he saw the potter. And it says he marred the clay on purpose and made it again into a beautiful vessel. He says, can I not do with you, Israel, that what I've done to this clay? He will mar you. And it's a beautiful thing to be marred by God. But it's to be humbled by God. So now that you know God and you are following him, looking for his truth to transform your life, be humble because he will continue to mar you. But he's the potter. And in those holes speaks love. And that's what's molding and shaping your life. And he uses the water of the word continually to shape and mold your life. And that's why he says, you, O soldier of Christ, are my battle axe and my weapon of war. You are that. Isn't that amazing that God says that about you? You are my battle axe. You are my weapon of war. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should never allow God's name to be blasphemed in our lives. Because what it does is it blasphemes his name. It says that the grace of God is not enough for us. That's why he calls us that battle axe and that weapon of war. Jesus prayed that the Father would send the Holy Spirit in John chapter 17. Once again, we see the triune God fulfilling his promise. For we are baptized into one name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. It's one name even though it's three in person, and each are identified in those names. Jesus came to give us an understanding of God's will so that we might know him who is true, so that we might know that we are, in fact, 
in his son, Jesus Christ, for he has eternal life. And the second was so that we might bear fruit to God and that we might be his witnesses. He says, for this reason, I have appeared to you. And for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness. A witness to the reality of the fact of what he's done on the cross. And then a minister to minister to other people as you lay down your life. As you're identified with his death and you're walking in the power of his resurrection, we fellowship in his suffering because he desires to go to people that don't know him. So when you go to the doctor and you think, why am I going to the doctor? If you go to the store and you think, why am I being interrupted by this crazy guy that's just cut me off that doesn't know Jesus? Well, every place we go, we're led in the path of righteousness for whose sake? Our sake? No, for his name's sake. His namesake. So, wherever you go, remember, if you're willing to suffer and to enter into fellowship with him, he wants to reveal himself to other people through your life because Christ is living his life through yours. Because you've been identified with his death and now you're walking in the power of his resurrected life, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. That gets us to this. As we abide in Christ, we bear fruit to God, meaning as Christ is formed in us, we bear the very image of Christ, which is God's divine nature. As we receive Christ's word into our hearts, it is then that we begin to bring forth fruit to God, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. What does that mean? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. We love with the very same love that we've been loved with. Joy overflowing from our hearts because of our great salvation. The joy of the Lord is my strength, it says in Nehemiah. This gives us eternal peace with God. We now can be long-suffering toward those knowing that God is long-suffering with us. We can be kind to those who are cruel, gentle to those that are brutal. We can choose to do good and not evil, evil when we suffer. And we can bear the virtue of self-control when the desires of our flesh, the lust of the world, and the God of this age attempts to blind us to the reality of God's goodness and our promise of our everlasting, eternal inheritance. Because the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit. Even though you see all those fruits, it's one working together in unison. Because it's a picture of Jesus Christ, and the essence of God. And when they're all working in tandem, all of them are coming true. You can be faithful to your vows and your promises because you have self-control, because your love is what's motivating you at that moment. And you can be kind, and you can bear and be patient with others. Though God is incomprehensible for us to contain, We can know God to the degree that he has chosen to reveal himself. We must work within the light that God has chosen to reveal himself, which is in the word of God. I'm going to say that again. The Trinity stands together as both creator and savior. Our Lord and God, our savior, imparts to us the spirit from on high, which gives us the three manifestations of God's all-sufficient grace. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he says this, while you have light, believe in the light. Why? So that you may become sons of light. That's taking on his divine nature. Walk while you have light. Walk while you have light. It was once said concerning the doctrine of the Trinity, try to explain it and you will lose your mind, but if you deny it, you will lose your soul. So what we've done is our best to give you a small but significant aspect of God being one in essence and yet three in persons. Our prayer is that as you study and meditate on the Trinity all the days of your life, but that more importantly, that then beholding is knowing the triune God personally and intimately, for to know him is the only way to eternal life. So the next time we get together, we will dig deeper into as we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will 
dig into the covenant of redemption or the council of peace. That's where we're going next time, okay? The Lord is the only standard of perfection, goodness, love, knowledge, and truth. So let us exalt him in his unfailing love, his sovereign grace. Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, being set apart. Let us rejoice in Jesus for his great mercy that he's given us. It says, by his mercy, let us present ourselves a living sacrifice to God, both holy and acceptable, because we are accepted by God. Let us boast in the Lord for his salvation. Let us walk worthy of Christ and his goodness, his power, exalted position, because God reigns. God reigns. But we must say, God be reigning in my life. Remember what they said at, at the crucifixion? Crucify him, crucify him. I will not have this man rule over me. We say that by our actions when God is not reigning in our lives. He is clothed with majesty and he's clothed with strength. God remains the same in his essence, nature, will, and purpose. He sits on his holy throne. 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, to honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And this is another picture of the Trinity. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his spirit be with you all. We always end each class with that quote because of the fact that he is one God and yet three. One in essence, three in persons. So my prayer is, is that I gave you guys some questions, not that many, I've learned. There was 150, I think, at the very first class. I've narrowed it down to like 20 or 30, giving you guys a little bit of a break. I know it was a little bit overwhelming. And again, I've given you the purpose and the um, affirmation of our faith, of what we believe here at Calvary Chapel, which aligns with that of the Bible. It is basically the Apostles' Creed. Okay? So, is there any questions concerning the Trinity? Now, it's 8.30, so we could be here the rest of our lives with that kind of a question. But as far as what we've covered tonight, do you guys have any questions that perhaps either myself or Pastor Kevin or anyone else that's in the room that might have an answer? Um, do you guys have any questions concerning the stuff we covered? I know that you're in a lot of pain right now, Brandon, but do you have any questions? Yeah. Gabe, you got a question. Um, it's been out there, but I pretty much designed that particular one. Usually it's got, you know, it doesn't say in the Father. But yeah, they've been out for a long time. I think it was called the uh, Holy Shield or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's been out for a while. But the other stuff that went with it, the scriptures, the Holy Spirit helped me with that a little bit. So does everyone understand the Trinity in justification and the Trinity in sanctification? Do you understand the role of the Holy Spirit in sanctification? Does anyone remember what the definition of sanctification means? To be set apart. So how does the Holy Spirit set us apart? What's that? Excuse me, Wade. I can't hear you. Convicting us? Okay. So, huh? Through a guide. Okay, that's a good one. Where has he guided us to? <laughs> so, it says that we are set apart by being united to Christ. 
Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected, he ascended. Where is he now? He's, a, he's in heaven. He's in the third heaven. He's on the throne. That's how he sets you apart. Through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, he says, I'm not of this world. You are no longer of this world because you have been set apart by the Holy Spirit who anointed you and connected you to Christ, united with Christ by that same power that rose Jesus from the grave. You have been united to Christ. You are now in an everlasting world. You're no longer of this world, even though you're in it. We went through that a little bit last time. We looked at Ephesians um, 1. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So there's two realities. In Ephesus and yet in Jesus Christ. In Grants Pass and yet in in Christ on the throne spiritually. We have to understand that theology and make it a reality. We are there, and yet we are sent into the world, just like Jesus was. But you've got to sit, you've got to stand before you can walk in this world. Sit on that throne with Christ, stand on that reality that you're in Christ and nothing can separate you because if you were outside of the kingdom, and now you're inside, you can never be separated because you can never come back here. Even though you're in the world, you're not of it because you're of an everlasting world and dominion. We're not under the dominion of sin and death. We're under the dominion of life and peace. When we make that a reality, every single morning when you get up, you go to the Father by the blood of the lamb, not based on your merit, and you go and you sit at that throne and you say, Father, thank you that I have access by faith and that I'm justified as I never sinned. And now as I sit with you on that throne, I want to stand on what I believe, which is this firm foundation, which is on the apostles, on the prophets, Jesus Christ being The cornerstone, we went through that. You stand there. You have no other place to stand. And now you walk in that resurrected life because you've been identified with his death because you're there. That's what gives us victory over the world. Our what? Faith in what he's done for us. We're in Christ Jesus by God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can walk in victory by saying, I have just sinned against you. Your light has revealed it. That's of the old. That's none of the new. I confess it. I turn from it. That's the gift of repentance. I'm walking after you. Thank you, Lord. It's not perfection, but it's a whole different direction. And you walk in that direction all the days of your life. And as the light becomes brighter, it becomes brighter unto an everlasting day. That was our first at the very beginning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that you've just given us a small glimpse into the Trinity, our triune God that we worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can be holy because it is the very nature and essence of who you are by giving us your Spirit who is holy. Thank you for setting us apart from sin, the world, death, the lie of Satan that wants to distort and twist and bend everything. We've been under his will for far too long. Now we long to be doing your will. You said, if anyone does the will of his Father, you will come and abide, you will abode, you will make your home within our life, our heart, our soul. So Father, be our God. Lord Jesus, Not only be our savior, but be our potter, be our shepherd, be our king, be our redeemer, be our bread that we are satisfied with so that the world doesn't satisfy us, the flesh doesn't satisfy us, that we're not deceived through those things any longer. 
Lord, we want to taste and see, just like Pastor Kevin said, that you are good. It's the goodness of God that leads us to turn from that and turn from idols to God. Because it's something that you've done. You've drawn us to yourself. You've illuminated us. You've revealed yourself. And as we turn to you, we turn from those things. It's a gift. So Lord, we want to have this living water, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit abounding and overflowing in our lives so that other people see you and taste and see how good you are. And we can bear fruit to you. And as you eat of it, you are satisfied with the labor of your soul, it says. And as we bear fruit, I pray, Lord, that other people will pick and eat of it. They will eat of that love and taste of that love and experience that love and experience the joy and experience the peace that's real. That's not just behavior. It's a nature within. It's reality. Help us to have control when everything is out of control. Help us to be faithful because you've been faithful toward us and you've given us the gift of faith and we grow by faith by being immersed in your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must add to our faith that virtue, that knowledge of self-control, being kind to each other, being loving to each other. Lord, help us not to be short-sighted but long-sighted. We want to see eternity. We want to see heaven. We want to see New heavens and new earth are forever home of righteousness. We don't want to see temporary things. We want to see eternal things. Those things which will last forever. Help us not to trade the eternal for the present through deception, through giving in. Lord, may you become a reality in our lives. So we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the gift of revelation. We thank you for the gift of truth that sets us free. So, Lord, have your way. Lord, I pray a blessing upon those that are here. Bless them tonight. Make your face shine upon them. Lift up your countenance. Give them your peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. We ask a safe way home. And until we meet again, which will be Wednesday, we pray, Lord, over their souls and that you would keep them like you promised. For you who have begun a good work in them, you'll be faithful to complete it unto the day that we see you face to face. We thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen.